Hey guys welcome to my channel. I hope you're well. This is a story about what if Deku had a blood court part 5 so I hope you enjoy. The title of the fanfiction we will be listening to is Blood for the Blood God and it's by Ryujin Mao on fanfiction.net. So please go check out the fanfiction and the author in the description and support them for making this great story. But anyways let's get to the story. The afternoon was settling down, the sun painting the horizon in beautiful tones of orange. At the area of Dagoba Beach, there were some people who began revisiting the beach. It had been recently been put under a private watch, but still open for the public to visit, which they did, since it had become a rather nice spot since it was anonymously been cleaned of most of the garbage that used to pollute it. There was still the odd fridge or car wreck, but those seemed to be disappearing permanently. That the police had been doing more frequent patrols over the area seemed to help too. The heroes weren't much help, many other things could bring in much more revenue and cash than the voluntary cleanup of the place. Not that Izuku minded doing the occasional cleanup routine. It was his property after all. Checking on the spacious piece of land was one of the reasons why he was currently here, but most importantly, it was his training spot. Since it was private property, he could make use of his powers without being admonished by it. The vampire had a few shipping containers stationed, equipment he had bought from my island to help develop the place. From the current 520-foot containers there, only one was important for him right now. The one containing a great deal of training equipment, which Izuku had many plans for. The doors of the metal box were opened, allowing his Izuku to store his school supplies and change his attire to something more exercise-friendly. After classes ended, the vampire had decided that if he was to help his raven-headed friend, they would need to start immediately so as to have the best results possible. UA Sports Festival was an event that could not be underestimated, it had surpassed the Olympics for a reason. Hence, the Hemomancer decided it would be the best for him to learn early on what he was working with. Izuka checked the time in his phone, glad to have it back, waiting for the confirmation that his friend had gotten permission from his parents to arrive home somewhat later than is usual. Inkomama was also warned in time, else the vampire would suffer the wrath of the heavens. The green-headed teen began stretching, slowly checking over all the life liquid inside his body. He had been slowly chipping away at the resistances of the other quirk factors inside his bloodstream, two more already submitting to his will. Shock absorption, from the Nomu and, warp, from the villain named Kirojiri had been cracked, his blood finally decoding their factors and allowing Izuku to understand their inner workings. As he proceeded to do push-ups, the vampire closed his eyes and allowed his mind to drift deep inside himself. Crimson slowly dyed his vision, before everything around him was a murky darkness, he was inside the deepest layers of his mind, the place where he caged the inner beast. Two rubies stared at him from inside the black nothingness, the knowledge that he'd acquired from the two quirk factors. The shining spheres of red then began to mix with their noir background, slowly dyeing the place crimson. crimson. As the insides of his mind began to paint themselves, Izuku began to have the secrets unveiled to him. The simplistic, shock absorption, was just that. Its effects were easily simulated within his body, his muscles beginning to mutate to adapt to their new improvement. The full assimilation of the effects would need a few more days, but Izuku could say that he had mastered the acquired effects of this power. This one though, he mused in his head as he tried to make sense of what composed, warp. A simplistic look at the quirk would only mean that, a power to warp to different locations. The quirk factor running in his bloodstream, however, was much more than that. It seemed manufactured, almost as if one had taken the original quirk apart and then modified it to an obscene amount, forcefully stitching it back and calling it a day. The vampire's body was trying to find a way to simulate the effects, but there still seemed to be something mission from the equation. Almost as if Izuku needed another quirk factor to stimulate, warp, into full submission. Even when fully cultivated like this, you still want to resist, huh? The deal when cultivating complex quirks was time, patience, and simpler quirk factors to throw at it. Almost like leveling up a character in an RPG. Ha, huh, quite the comparison, right? He snorted in his mind, resurfacing from his mind. The vampire finished his warm-up, clapping his hands together to rid them of the sand of the beach. 
He once more checked his phone, finding a message from Tokoyami that said the teen was close by. Not much time had passed since Azuku had been in his head, so the vampire replied that he was wa waiting. Pocketing his device, the green-headed teen began pulling at the available strings of warp. The cogs inside his blood began to work, allowing Izuku to feel his power fulling the quirk factor. The vampire shivered as he began to feel something tiny exit every pore of his skin, his eyes catching the smoke-like mist that began to manifest around him. Isn't this interesting? He grinned, eyes glancing at the top of the open container in front of him. Izuku tugged carefully at the new active power, feeling it bend to his will. Now, how do we do this? He fixed his stance, not knowing what to expect. Contrary to his active mind, hunter instincts seemed to have a good idea of what to do, since he felt the answer float to his mind with the ghost of a whisper. Flash step. A flex of his legs in Izuku met the right door of the container, a dull noise emitting as he hit it full force. After a few seconds, he fell on the sandy ground, annoyed at his now broken nose. Okay, not what I was expecting, could be worse, I guess. He muttered to himself, thankful that he had merely crashed into the metal door. It would be rather bad if he were to, say, teleport inside the metal. As things stood, he would not be teleporting anywhere anytime soon. At most, it was an upgrade to his original technique, since he felt he had gone several times faster than his previously fastest speed, and there was no strain in his leg muscles. It was faster and less energy consuming than, flash step. I also felt a bit lighter, but I guess it has to do with the fact that the original power was something of a teleportation. Since it is an upgrade to another one of my skills, I guess another new name for it is a must. I guess, Blink, will be a good good name for it. I was faster than even my eyes, a breaching move faster than eyesight. Before he had any more time for testing, the vampire's ears picked the sound of shifting sand, the steps of his friend alerting Izuku of his approaching presence. Not that it dissuaded the vampire from his current train of thought, even with his back onto the sand, arms crossed into a pensive form. That is a rather interesting pose for musing thoughts, my comrade, but as a fellow abyss watcher, it is my duty to warn thee that thy appearance can be considered weird for those not initiated among our group. The deep voice of his friend made Izuku look into his direction, finding one Tokoyami fumikage walking his way towards him, dressed into a tracker suit. Izuku lifted himself with a quick flip, craning his neck sideways as he rose a hand to greet his friend. Hey Tokoyami. Needless to say, the raven-headed teen was curious as to the method of training his blood-consuming friend would introduce to him. Dark Shadow has been rather incessant in its pursuit of betterment, so convincing my parental figures of my training has flowed smoothly, my friend. We can start right now if it would please you. The teen's quirk manifested from his midsection, giving a thumbs up to the vampire. I, sir. Izuku smiled at the sight, comfortable enough to fully show the pearly white fangs in his mouth. Well, let's not disappoint it then, right? He exclaimed, closing his right fist in enthusiasm. I remember your physical parameters from the quirk testing with Aizawa Sensei, did those change? Receiving a negative headshake from Fumikage, Izuku pulled his phone and began typing. I need you to tell me exactly what you can do right now. Anything and everything that comes to your mind will be helpful, since with those I can figure out a training schedule that won't hinder your day-to-day -day in school, neither will leave you sore for the day of the festival. Festival. The vampire explained his reasoning to the raven teen, making him nod in comprehension. I see. Well, I am somewhat lacking in the physical department. Since, Dark Shadow, can act as my strength, I leave most of the heavy lifting for him. Its power increases in proportion to the shadows around us, while our strength decreases while exposed to light. Tokoyami continued explaining his power as Izuku instructed him to do some stretches. The vampire noted everything down and began analyzing it, while he helped the raven-headed teen with his exercise. Nothing too straining, just a few calisthenics to start with. The sun completely dipped down and the lights around the beach lit up, the twilight a beautiful sight. It also seemed to have an effect on Fumikage, seeing as he seemed to receive a second wind. I almost forgot to mention, but as Dark Shadow gets stronger, it also becomes more disobedient. 
it can be quite hard to find the balance among our intoxicating strength and savagery. Almost as if to accentuate that very fact, the sentient mass of shadows formed itself behind the teen, crossing its arms and scoffing at the duo. What do you punks know about power, huh? Buzz off! Izuku had an awkward smile as he watched the rebellious quirk look down on them. It was not something he was expecting, the shift in mood for the normally pleasant living shadow to become this hostile. Right. Tokoyami, do you know any martial arts or have practiced some sort of self-defense? Izuku had a few ideas that he wanted to test out, but first he needed to be sure of a few things. The other teen shook his head. An oversight in my judgment, my friend, I know not the ways of the warrior. Since I'm most reliant in, dark, dark shadow, fighting is outside of my expertise. Fumikage admitted, a bit ashamed of himself. Izuka shook his head, waving at the teen. It's not a problem, it means we can start you properly into something without any bad habits. Izuku pointed out, bringing a tendril of blood out from his palm in the shape of a mannequin. It would be ideal for you to have something extra in case you can't use your quirk for whatever reason. I'm not saying it is bad to specialize in quirked combat, but you don't know what you will encounter out there, an ace in the hole is never a bad idea. The vampire rubbed his left shoulder as if massaging an old wound. Tokoyami nodded to his statement, aware of his bad habit of over-reliance in his quirk. That said, we can't exactly overhaul the way you are accustomed to use your quirk in such a short period of time. But let's leave that for a while, let me see how you fight. Izuku said, bringing out his blood gauntlets into action. The life liquid covered the arms of the Hemomancer, who fixed his stance for their fight. Tokoyami tilted his head to the side. My friend? Confusion was clear on the teen's face. Seeing you fight will let me see the exiting flaws in your fighting style, as well as letting you practice control over Dark Shadow while in its empowered state. Even if it is disobedient, I don't see it wishing to lose a fight, or am I wrong? Izuku asked both the teen and his quirk, the shadowy monster flexing its claws and extending to attack the vampire. Damn right I won't lose. Come already, Fumi. We need to beat his ass. The quirk dragged its user into the fight, the teen not being able to do much besides follow his quirk. Izuku ducked under the two-handed claw swipe countering by delivering a low gut punch into Tokoyami. The raven team backed off, the living shadow attached to him snarling at the weakness of his host. Not that Izuku allowed them, them to retreat, pursuing the duo and delivering a rising uppercut into the shadow monster. The quirk stunned, Izuku quickly got close to the host, armored right hand into a flat shape ready to strike at Tokoyami. The vampire stopped just short of touching the neck of his friend, his other protected hand going up to protect Izuku from the hammer blow that came from the shadow quirk. It seemed that Izuku was unaffected by the strength of the hit, the vampire looking no worse for wear. My win. If I were a villain, your neck would be open already. Izuku stated, the barest hints of a dim blow in his eyes. Dark shadow, backed off, clearly not pleased by the capture of its host. If the human could keep up with its amazing power, it would not need to hold itself back so much. Fumikage himself had some sweat running down the side of his head, aware that his defeat had been much too quicker than what he expected. That he could not control his quirk as he wanted might have an effect too, since the sun had been gone and, Dark Shadow, had gotten an exponential boost in power. The vampire made his gauntlets fluid, the life liquid becoming an amalgamation of tendrils that captured the shadow mass and brought it down to the sand. More unearthly light flowed from the eyes of the Hemomancer, the crimson eyes of Izuku staring at the yellow spots of the sentient quirk. Don't get ahead of yourself, shadow being. You and your host must be in synchrony, otherwise the result of these bouts will never change, your increase in power thanks to the night is not a reason for arrogance. Izuku's voice deepened as he stared at the living mass of darkness, the quirk staring back at him. Growling began building up at the, the back of the vampire's throat, the low hum akin to that of a feral beast. The sentient quirk tried to wiggle out of its blood bounds, finding the increasing intensity of the crimson eyes to be unsettling. How ironic, for the quirk that gave life to the shadows to be afraid of an inhabitant of it. Whatever the case, Dark Shadow nodded to the vampire, not wishing to upset him any longer. 
That ghostly hand seemed to be invading its mind had nothing to do with it, Dark Shadow was not afraid of no mind manipulators. Although, it did not wish for one to try his tricks in itself. AI sir, but, it is not over. Fumikage finally had greater control over the shadow powers inside his body, Dark Shadow, relenting its control to the host. The teen thanked his friend for the intervention, Izuku waving it off. Thank you, my friend. Sometimes it becomes too difficult to tame my darkness, its power too much amplified. Izuku shook his head to his raven-headed friend. No, that's not all of it. The vampire went to the open container and fetched three water bottles, offering his classmate and his quirk the refreshments. I know that sometimes your quirk can have a great influence over you, I had my fair share of moments with, true ancestor, but something seems to be amiss between you two. Fumikage looked to the side, finding his water bottle to be suddenly much too interesting. The living darkness that was over him opened its own bottle, dumping the contents, contents over itself and then shaking the water off much like a bird when bathing. Fumi is a wimp. Dark Shadow. Don't dark shadow me, Fumi. Shadow Dweller saw straight through you, and he did not need to have a psycho whatever degree thingy. Shadow Dweller, Fumi minds too much what others say about us. He says he doesn't mind, but he won't let go when we become powerful. The quirk ranted, increasing in size as time went by. Aggression started seeping into its voice, the living shadow then pointing one finger into the chest of the raven teen. If only you let go, we could rampage freely. Have them fear our power. Such behavior is not heroic. We don't need to become monsters, like they want us to be. I cannot give in to the whispers of darkness. Tokoyami surprised Izuku as the teen and his quirk seemed to be on the edge due to something. Not that Izuku couldn't understand the reasons of their conflict. Dark, related quirks usually brought their fair share of troubles for their users, considering the societal view on the powers. Added upon that was the fact that the brain chemistry of the individuals with such powers usually was one that pushed for aggression and scheming, Izuku himself being the proof of that. Izuku could relate and understand what Tokoyami might be going through, seeing as he also had tight restraints over his powers. If he were to explain the nature of his powers to someone who wasn't fooled by the novelty of his, vampirism, quirk, such person might immediately associate him with a monster. The vampire did not deny that fact. In all honesty, Izuku had already embraced that nature of his quirk. He acknowledged the existence of the inner beast and locked it behind bars of willpower. It was a part of him, and the quirk itself might be aware that it was dangerous. Izuku released it from time to time, tending to its needs. No, tending to his dark needs. But enough about him, he wanted to help his friend out. Toko Tokoyami. The vampire called the attention of his classmate. You remember what I said back on the trip to the USJ? Fumikage and his quirk became pensive, the living mass of shadow slowly diminishing in size. The teen looked to Izuku. I remember it, which is why I wanted to ask your assistance. You, my friend, seem to have a grasp on how to deal with your darkness better than I do. I just, it is hard to speak about it. The raven teen lowered his head, making his quirk scoff at him. Izuku glared at the living darkness, the quirk looking to the other side to avoid the eyes of the vampire. I won't say that what works for me might work for you, each person has their own challenges and their struggles. I will say this though, your quirk is wonderful. I understand the challenge with violent thoughts and dark desires, but you resisting that or using them in productive ways is proof of your worth, Tokoyami. The vampire said, offering his hand to the teen. When I was feeling down and wondering if I was really deserving of all I had, someone told me this, you already are a hero. Unleashing your darkness is fine. Accept those emotions is one the steps into controlling them. Never neglect yourself. I know you will be an amazing hero, Tokoyami. Midoriya, but my inner desires are of destruction, I don't want to become a monster. Humikage said, staring at his hand. Dark Shadow was right behind him, almost as if the quirk was judging what words would leave the teen. What is wrong is for you to become their monster. I don't know who said what to you, Tokoyami, 
but those words only define you as much as you allow them to. Become what you want to be. Sometimes, a monster is just what is needed to save the day. Izuku said with a light tone, fangs reflecting the light of the near nearby reflectors. The raven teen looked as if struck. He slowly let a smile settle on his beak. How pathetic of me, spilling my secrets and issues on a friend like this, thank you, Midoriya. Fumikage lowered his head to the vampire. Dark Shadow still looked like it wanted to rampage, but it held back for now. Izuku smiled at his friend. Things have gotten quite sappy, haven't they? Come on, let's keep training. The face of betrayal on the Raven Teen's face was quite a treat for the Hemomancer. You did not think that we were done for the day, did you? The living darkness laughed heartily, readying itself for another round. Fumi was totally having an emotional moment there, Shadow Dweller. Dark Shadow For all the students of UA, classes continued at their normal rate. Needless to say, all who wanted to participate in the festival were preparing themselves, working on their specialties. Tensions were still low, two weeks still remaining until the fabled day. At the Heroics Class 1A, this tension could be felt rather early. They were the hot topic of the school, the students who had survived a villain attack. Expectations were high for the class, and the students displayed that they understood that fact. The serious mood was obvious on the heavy hitters for the class. There was also something that was calling the attention of the class. Midoriya Izuku, the class vice president, seemed to be a mystery that none could understand. He was a quiet teen, but his presence could not be ignored, at least for his classmates such possibility was not available. The teen's quirk wasn't exactly known, but it had to deal with blood. His blood to be necessary. He had called himself a vampire, and many thought it was a joke, something to light the mood around him. Now, the cloud of doubt spread among some of the teens in the class. The resident vampire was powerful, that went without question. Af after the events of the USJ, a few of his classmates wished to know more about him. Or at least she wished too. Yayorozu Momo wanted to thank the teen for his efforts. He had personally saved her in Kyuka, jumped to Aizawa sensei without anyone asking and even after his brutal beatdown at the hands of an enormous villain, the vampire refused to be still, helping All Might before the other pro heroes arrived. She had seen it all from the safety of her binoculars, yet the sight still managed to make her sick to her stomach. No normal person could return after that. Yet, like a contradiction to normal sense, Izuku had done so, performing like the perfect hero all of them should strive to become. His actions were heroic and proper. So why could Momo not stop shivering when she glanced his way? She had even tried talking with Jairu about it, hoping that talking about it would help her settle her feelings and talk with the teen. Her friend had suggested simply doing that, going straight to the vampire and talking to him. It was a simplistic idea. Ripping the band-aid at once, so that she could put everything past her and return things to the usual. The daughter of the Yayarozu would not be intimidated simply by a boy. Thus, after the end of today's classes, she and Kyuka would talk with him and thank the resident vampire for his efforts in rescuing them. After the last bell sounded, she glanced at her rocker friend, Jairu rolling her eyes and nodding to her. The duo turned to search for Izuku, but he was no longer in class. That was another thing about him, at the least expected moment, he seemed to simply vanish out of sight. He was here a moment ago. Momo exclaimed, looking at the remaining classmates and hoping for an answer to her silent question. Izuku Kuwan? Yeah, he does that. I think he might be at Dagoba Beach, that's where he said that he was training at. Yararika Ochako, one of her classmates, answered. Why is he training there? There. Jairu asked, seemingly more interested in her phone than the answer to her question. Yurarika searched her school bag for a few moments, fishing her phone out. He said that he had permission for quirk training there, something about private property. I visited there once, it is super neat. The beach is beautiful. That only rose more questions inside Momo's head. How could Izuku have permission to train his quirk on the beach? Private ground? 
A person could no simply own a beach. Could they? If I'm not mistaken, he is also helping out Tokoyami Kuan with his training. I asked if I could go too, but I have been a bit busy. Ochako explained with a kind smile. Yaya Rozu released a disappointed sigh. Her punk friend shook her head sideways, lightly touching the taller girl on the shoulder. Come on, Yamamo, we just have to hit the beach then. Kyuka said, pointing to the sliding door of their class. Momo nodded, searching her school bag for her phone. She typed on it and then tucked her phone back on her bag. Right away then, I have called for our ride. The girl spoke normally, making Kyoka look questioningly at Momo. Said girl just smiled as the duo made their way to the front gates of the school. Needless to say, the rocker girl was speechless when a black limousine was waiting for them to come. She felt the stares of some of the other students, their murmurs making the girl blush in shame. Yamamo, could you not have warned me first about the limo? Jairu whisper slash shouted at her friend, raising her bag to her face with one hand, the other twirling one of her ear jacks nervously. Yayorozu looked at her friend and found the reaction of the rocker to be weird. She then looked as if realization hit her. Is this not suitable enough for us to visit a classmate? I asked fa father for the least exposing car, I should have known better. She shook her head, disappointed at her lack of forethought. Jairu, on the other hand, had her mouth hanging low. This is the least exposing car? Rapidly, the punk dissuaded her friend of her idea. No way. This is fine. It is really okay. Don't call for another one. Momo looked curiously at the girl at her side. Are you sure? I can call for another vehicle, it won't take long to reach here. The rich girl asked innocently, but relented to her friend as they entered the car and left the school building behind. The ride took about 30 minutes, the beach coming into view and making the girls take in the wonderful sight that it was during sunset. Soon, they reached what they could identify as training grounds. The area was no different from the majority of its surroundings, with the exception of the red metal containers that dotted the scape. Yayorosa recognized the logo of Shield Industries on them, aware that whatever was inside those containers was considerably expensive, even by her standards. Kyuka was impressed by it, but her lack of knowledge on the subject of technological advancement that the Shield family had brought about was the reason she had not freaked out. Now Momo wished further to know who Midoriya Izuku was, that he had the connections to have such equipment. Young miss, we have reached your desired location. The voice of the driver made the girls glance at him. The driver's glass was tinted, not allowing a look at the driver, but Yaya Rosa smiled and nodded. Thank you Kagiyama-san. My friend and I will walk from here, and I'll text you to pick us up. Momo said in a polite tone. Right. Do not hesitate to call upon me, should you ever need it. Kyoka could picture the kind of man that was behind that black tinted glass, seriously, how can someone be this loaded in cash? She wondered, following Yayarozu as the duo exited the car and began walking closer to the shipment containers. As they approached, the girls managed to spot a few other civilians gathered, seemingly overlooking something. The girls glanced at each other before they moved closer. Kyuka was the first to hear the sounds of what seemed to be a battle. It must be Midoriya and Tokoyami, Yuraraka said they were training together. The rocker girl was hearing rather strong blows and loud wind rushing, increasing her pace somewhat as curiosity got a hold of her. What are they doing? What is going on there? The punk and the taller girl quickly closed in on the scene, their eyes capturing the sight of their classmates. The scene looked not unlike something from a mythological tale or painting, Midoriya was dressed in workout attire, his arms and legs clad with his quirk making him resemble some sort of bloody knight or monster of the underworld, the sinister gleam that emanated from his eyes made shivers run down the spines of these two girls. His face was also covered up with a solid mask that resembled a dragon's maw, making the vampire truly seem like some sort of hellspawn. Tokoyami also had his quirk out. The raven-headed teen working together with the living mass of darkness as they tried to strike Izuku with a flurry of blows. The teen himself merely moved to follow his quirk, trying the odd punch or kick in efforts of hitting the green-headed teen. 
Less monstrous a sight, but he still made for an intimidating image with his sharp gaze and the literal monster of darkness that followed his command. The clash of monsters was how Yayorozu pictured this scene. The teens seemed to be immersed in their combat, not paying any attention to the civilians looking at their training. It struck her as rather odd that none, none were trying to take pictures or record the happening, but she herself could not take her eyes off the event. The fight continued. Izuku was obviously the more experienced fighter, dodging blows and rushing to strike with precise strength. Enough to hurt, not enough to surpass the threshold of Tokoyami, but to alert the teen to his mistakes. About 10 minutes passed with their continuous exchange, when it seemed that the vampire wanted to settle for the day. Momo found herself shocked when she failed to notice the blanket of spreading darkness that was coming from the horizon. The fight had been that absorbing. Izuka fixed his stance, exhaling a deep breath. He stared at his friend, seeing the other teen also get ready for the last move of their training for today. The vampire nodded, immediately rushing to meet the dark shadow, quirk user. The raven had guided his quirk to do an overhead strike, while he also fixed himself into a fighter's stance, ready to throw a punch. The vampire accepted the challenge, the big claws of the living being of darkness descending with the force of a sledgehammer. The blow was sure to hit Izuku and hammer him in the sandy ground like he was a nail. Then, Izuku simply stopped, a few centimeters shy of kissing the mass of darkness. The hit rose many clumps of sand, blocking the fumicage sight and making him groan in frustration. Then, a hand tapped his shoulder and he spun around with his best at a backhand blow. His fist flew over air, only for his head to snap back as he received a full counter straight to his chin, the blow crumbling any resistance Tokoyami could offer as he fell backwards like a wood board. Dark Shadow tried to resist, but with the host weakened, it could only follow suit. Ow, that was a mean one, friend. Tokoyami slurred a bit, massaging the underside of his beak. Izuku could only grimace, he dismissed, he dismissed his power and called back his blood, offering a hand to aid the other team to stand up. Expect the unexpected. The vampire offered advice as he made sure that his classmate would not keel over. The duo of teens made their way to one of the metal containers, the only one opened. That made the girls awake from their days. That was, something. Kyuka said, I still fixed on the spot where Tokoyami had hammered a hit. Momo had no idea what to say about that. She did not have many instances where he had seen live combat like this. She practiced, of course, and was very much diligent in her training. However, this was completely different from what she expected. The heiress had heard much talk about the entrance exam and the combat robots, but to see two of her classmates capable of such show of skill and power, it made her mind question if it truly was fair for her to be a recommendation. She let that doubt aside, coughing lightly to gather the attention of Kyuka. Ahem, that certainly was impressive. We still need to talk to Midoriya-san. The taller girl began to make her way down the steps of the stone stairs, towards the metal containers. The civilian crowd that got to watch the event began to disperse, a few signs around put that area as off-limits to regular folk. Wait up, Yamamo. The punk girl began following her friend. They approached the big metal box, wisps of conversation between the two teens reaching them. Their footsteps were not quit, shifting the sand under them with each step. Yet, it seemed to not be heard by the duo, or they cared not for who was approaching. Yayorozu and Kyuka reached the container, going around it to meet their classmates. As they turned the corner, they picked on a rather disturbing sight. They had seen it happen once in class, the first combat trial when Izuku latched on Kirishima's neck. Neck. Yet, seeing it up close was much different from what any of them expected. The young heiress was stunned into silence as she saw Izuku biting down on Tokoyami's offered right arm, drinking blood directly from the limb as the raven had wiped his head off the sweat. Kyuka was by her said, and she herself was stunned by the sight. It was something unusual, the image of the usually quiet greenhead looking like a voracious predator feeding his eternal thirst on one of their classmates made for something unsettling. The four stayed in silence, the two males deeply invested in their conversation and circumstances and the girl stunned by the sight. A few seconds passed by and Izuku immediately let go of Tokoyami's arm, quickly wiping his mouth and clamping his mouth shut. 
He gulped down the blood already in his gullet, the sweet sensation of live feeding suppressed as his classmates had caught him. Drinking packaged blood in front of others was fine, but someone seeing him at his most vulnerable and arguably dangerous state messed with him. The silence grew uncomfortable, the tension thick enough to be cut with a knife. The four teenagers stayed there, not uttering a single sound, the background noise of the waves not serving its usual purpose of being relaxing. The girls looked around awkwardly, trying to form a coherent sentence as the males kept their silent and avoided their eyes. So, drinking blood, that's pretty metal. Kuka was the first to interject at the situation. She would admit that she was not the social butterfly type, but it seemed that everyone else had decided to clam up. So fuck it, she took a shot. Tokoyami met her gaze, mind slowly piecing what he would say. The raven head nodded, courage building up. We, were training for the school festival, it was merely a payment for the, for the aid of a friend. Fumikage glanced at Izuku, gauging the reactions of the vampire. The green-headed vampire took a deep breath, hiding his hands behind his back and pushing the inner beast back into its cage. His mind howled at him, demanding the blood of the harlots that dared interrupt a most sacred time. He would drain them until the limit, keeping them alive only to serve as mere bloodbags to amuse his thirst and satisfy his curiosity as per the effects of long-term exposure to mesmerize and no calm down midoriya izuku mind over matter control yourself you are yourself cage the beast izuku awkwardly smiled at the two gals doing his best to not growl h hello t there I did not know you two were coming over. He knew his smile was forced, his expression plastered with fake politeness that he barely could hold up. Hey Midoriya. Kyuka managed to give him a wave, her eyes did not seem to hold judgment in them. Izuku could not smell fear coming from her, her entire body expression seemed to show only surprise and curiosity. His inner beast still growled, this time more interested in tasting her blood rather than enslave her mind. We tried texting you, but you did not answer the phone. We wanted to talk with you. Izuku nodded to her words, eyes focusing on the taller girl by Kyuka's side. Yaya Rozu avoided his gaze, her complexion pale and she seemed to be trying her very best to not tremble in front of him. Her eyes wandered all over, trying hard to not catch his gaze. However, it eventually happened. Her black pupils drank in the sight of his green orbs the faint hints of crimson over them. Yayorozu would apologize later to all those that were here at Dagoba Beach. However, now she only managed to flee from the sight, shivers and tremors running all over her. Yamomo. Kyuka tried to rush to her friend, yet something soft wrapped around her wrist and stopped her. Her. Her eyes turned to see the crimson tentacle hold her in place, the vampire shaking his head sideways. Yaya Rosu-san has seen something that I would rather not show anyone. The sight can be disturbing. I understand her fear, and I recommend that you let her heal first. Let her wrap her mind around this issue, right now she might be prone to lashing out in fear. Cold logic washed over Izuku, the cries and howls of the inner beast being shut down. Kyuka tried to put a valid argument that such things did not matter right now that the girl needed a friend to help her understand what happened. Yet, she could not do that. The rocker girl glanced at Tokoyami for a helping hand, yet the ravenhead sided with the vampire. Gazing at the abyss when one is not ready is something that can overwhelm the mind of those weak of spirit. Letting her experience this on her lonesome will help build her mind for future events. We are meant to be heroes, overly coddling is not something we should allow ourselves to fall into. We shall help when necessary, such time is still not upon her. Chuka stared at the two males and processed their words in her head. They weren't wrong, but their approach felt callous. Or rather, of people that had seen such sight countless times. Chuka let that simmer in her thoughts for a while. Even she had went by the phase of name-calling back in junior school. Quirks that modified body, mutant types, parts were quite the target for those. She did not have that much of a problem, first because she could not care less of what people said about her, and her ear jacks weren't the weirdest thing out in the block. 
However, when the rocker took in mind what these two looked like and what they could apparently do, it made a lot of sense. Plus Azuku was an honest-to-god vampire that could control his blood in any way he so pleased, and that was what he had shown so far to the class. Coupled with his appearance, and needless of height, Midoriya was a head-turner. Plus Tokoyami had a raven head and could control an amalgamation of sentient darkness that answered to his beckoning call. He had an intense expression, even when quiet, and his deep voice was something that could make you shake in your boots if you met him in an alley at night. The punk girl relented to their points, nodding to them. Fine fine, you win. I'll text her later or something. Kyuka said in exhaustion. Don't take it personal, Midoriya, we came here specially to thank you for the save back in the USJ, but I guess that is out of the fray right now. Yamamo was, well, I don't know, maybe triggered by you drinking blood from Tokoyami. She pointed at the males, stirring some sand with her boots and fiddling with one of her jacks. Damn habit from whenever she is nervous. Izuku hummed an agreement, fishing out a few water bottles from the inside of the container. I don't mind it. He simply said, offering the drinks to his two classmates. Kyuka took a peek inside the big metal box, seeing all kinds of equipment for workout, as well as a mini fridge. She whistled, making Izuku chuckle a bit. Since you are already here, and we are done for the day, care to join us? Izuku politely invited Kyuka, bringing three foldable chairs from the container. After an intense workout, it's good to slowly stretch to avoid cramps. Since I heal quickly, only Tokoyami is left. We can sit and talk, while he finishes with his stretches. Kyuka fiddled with her earlobe, wondering about the idea. She had come here to thank him, and the two did not seem like bad company. She still wanted to message Yamamo and talk with the girl, but the words of the two began playing back in her mind. I feel like you are finding joy in my physical suffering, friend. Tokoyami complained, even as he began to do the calisthenics Suzuku had taught him. Nonsense. You can talk with any of our teachers about this, I guarantee that they will tell you the same answer. Izuku brushed the complaints of the raven head aside. Here, I'll even give you an aiding hand. Choose you music. The vampire went once more inside the big metal box, bringing out a small wireless music box. The device was styled after old vinyl players, the sight making Kyuka lean more on staying here. Anything that can instill hope into this abyss watcher for him to withstand this torture called stretching? Tokoyami complained making the rocker girl and the vampire glance at each other. Izuku motioned to her with his phone, but the girl shook her head. Izuku tapped his phone a few times, connecting his phone to the music box and choosing a music. Immediately, the box burst into life, the sound of bass starting the music that made the punk girl stare at the vampire as if he had grown a second head. The bass started the song strong, followed by the drums and then a high note from a guitar. It was foreign, the English words loud and clear. Oh, let's go. Steve walks down the street. With his brim pulled way down low. Kyuka blinked, wondering if this was some sort of elaborate ruse or if someone was pulling her leg. Tokoyami began bobbing his head to the jamming song, Izuku sitting down on his chair and closing his eyes for a few seconds, allowing him sight to properly watch his friend's exercises. The rocker was still in place, outright staring at the vampire and the raven. Another one bites the dust. And another one does, another one does. Another one bites the dust. The girl grinned like mad, texting her mother and father about staying out a bit more. The following week continued much like the previous one, however, now the pressure was, was being felt around the entirety of the school as everyone became aware that the festival was just around the corner. Izuku gathered his things for lunch, grabbing his thermos flask and standing up to exit his class. Or so he would normally do, but instead he began approaching the windows. Izuku Kuwan? Yuraraka looked at the vampire, wondering what he was trying to do. Fuck off round face, fucking bloodsucker is probably scared of those piss ants by the door. Fucking coward. Bakugu said in surprisingly civil tone, making his way to the sliding door and revealing it to be blocked by a multitude of other students. The blonde narrowed his eyes, hands inside the pockets of his pants. 
The class 1A began to talk among themselves why the sudden visit of the other students, but Katsuki scoffed and loudly complained. You bootlickers still haven't figured this shit out? I expected them to be sulking around sooner than this, but I guess bottom feeders will still find a way to disappoint, even though I had no expectations for them. The blonde seemed to be extra abrasive to the new arrivals, making the mood immediately shift to one of aggression. Who does he think he is? Bastard. Don't think you are hot stuff just because you faced some villains. They must have been really weak. I bet you haven't even fought them. Complaints, jeers and the like began raining down upon the heroics class, many wondering why had the blonde had done such thing. Not that the bomber seemed to care for the angry mob of students just outside. I doesn't fucking matter what a bunch of losers think or say about me. At the top, all that garbage doesn't affect the winner. I'll reach the top and I'll be the best. That is all there is to it. Like a declaration of war, Bakugu sparked the flames of conflict and threw gasoline atop it. Some were stunned by his speech, others completely upset. If you garbage think you amount to anything, then try me. Reach my fucking level before you can talk, talk smack. When you sacks of shit do that, then I'll consider wasting my time with your empty words. The last statement almost caused pandemonium among the students, yet someone stood out. Clapping sounds followed as said person parted the sea of students that cluttered the doors of one at purple hair, tired bags under his eyelids and a vicious smirk, Hitoshi Shinso fearlessly walked right up to the bomber. I wanted to see the so-called special powerhouses of UA, but if this is the best they have to offer, I guess I will be pretty easy. Sarcasm almost dripping from his voice, the purple-haired teen smirked at the entire class indoors. Rumor down the grapevine is that those that stand out in the festival will be moved up from regular classes up to heroics. And there is also a chance that those from heroics that don't make the cut will be downgraded, I guess my work will be rather easy, if this is what they call hero material. As tensions rose higher and higher, Izuku decided to get the fuck out. Yet the voice that was speaking at the door was rather familiar. Mind robber. Will taker. Source of power. Delightful blood. Cold logic and raw instinct were raised to the maximum inside the vampire's mind as he recalled the events that led to the developing of one of his most powerful abilities. The cage in his mind strained to the maximum, the inner beast howled in absolute joy that the mind taker had presented himself. Such honor. It had to have at least one sip, for old time's sake. Izuku could not stop the killing intent that flowed from his body. Shivers ran down the spines of countless students all around, the source of the unsettling feeling unidentifiable for the majority of the students. Bakugu's head snapped right onto Izuku, the blondes face a mix of ravenous rage and increased excitement, the bomber raring for a fight. Do it, you fucking bastard. Give me the excuse. Todoroki stood from his chair, chair, a light frosty mist enveloping his right arm as he looked at the vampire. What th, such intent, just like him. Yayarozu seemed on the verge of vomiting anything that was in her stomach. I I I see can't. Izuka continued making his way out of his class from the window, but instead of dropping, he began climbing high. He reached the rooftop in a matter of seconds, his mouth harshly salivating as his fangs itched like crazy. He clenched his mouth shut with such strength that he feared having broken his teeth. The Hemomancer immediately opened his thermos and dumped the contents in his gullet, drinking the entirety of the one-liter flask in seconds. Not enough. More. His fingers almost cracked the screen of his phone, a message typed furiously fast. Izuku could feel another quirk factor unraveling, bending to his might. Yet, it required fuel to continue doing so. Seeing that familiar face, the one that started his hunt for new powers, the heat thirst, hit with the force of a speeding truck. Such a lust for power. Blood. The proof of life, that which flows through us all. I want it. I want it. An answer came, which he ignored completely. Not too long after, he managed to catch sight of one drone circling around him. He tried taming his inner beast, the cage in his mind breaking under the sudden powerful strain. The vampire heard the access door to the rooftop open up, 
Kyuka being the one that entered his sight instead of the person he had for. No. Don't. Not now. Growling left his throat as Izuku, blink, edit the girl, not even allowing her the chance to help him. He was upon her, grabbing both her wrists with one hand and raising them over her head as they almost slammed into the wall of the access point. He was in a high, a high, hunter instincts, going into overdrive at the sight of his first embraced blood giver. He stared deep into Jairu's eyes, stroking the gates of her mind in his haze with, mesmerize. Her ear jacks got up to attack, but small tendrils of blood exited his neck and entangled with her attacking lobes. The vampire got closer, nose catching a good whiff of her scent as he smelled her neck. Overflowing with vitality. She is such a good girl. Followed us by hearing alone. Others are bound to come. Rapid embrace? Not an ounce of pain for her. Aphrodisiac and numbing agents flooded his saliva as Izuku approached the exposed neck of the rocker girl, steam exiting his mouth as he opened up to bite, a chorus akin to an orchestra began blasting in his mind as Izuku approached the artery filled with oxygen-rich blood. His fangs lightly pierced the exposed neck before Izuku retreated, releasing Kyuka and turning his back on her, wishing he could claw his throat out. He almost reached for that very action, his nails growing as per his will. He would heal, he merely needed pain to distract from the thirst. Return. Feast on her blood. It was ours. Ours. No, it fucking wasn't. Another person entered through the door, this time the very help that he needed. May rushed his side, not even wasting time with words. She merely put her back against his chest, his hands naturally rushing to secure her in place as he pierced her neck with the same combination of chemicals in his mouth as he had almost done to Kyuka. Fresh blood soon filled his mouth, immediately soothing the raging storm that was happening in his mind. The punk rocker still approached him, surely to call him out for the monster he was. She could do so, it was her right. He could not meet her gaze, eyes buried into the pink locks of May. A hand settled over his shoulder, grabbing it as two jacks touched his neck and chest, vibrations, vibrations being emitted directly at him. It is okay. Take it easy. All is good. I do not deserve such good people, he mused in his head as he drank from May and was comforted by her and Kyuka. How pathetic, right? Such monster you are. It did not take long for Izuka to regain his senses after he drank May's blood, but the vampire still kept hugging the mechanic girl, eyes still avoiding the other rocker girl just behind him. He was feeling as if an eternity had passed, but his mind told him that only a few minutes had gone by. There was still plenty of time left for lunch break, much more so for the Hemomancer to try to explain his fuck up to his classmate. However, the million yen question was just that. How was he supposed to explain to someone else the innate, thirst, that he felt? His arms tightened a bit around his mechanic friend, the vampire taking another whiff of her scent to calm down, the thick motor oil that clung to her skin did wonders to appease him. That and her feminine scent was something he was used to, akin to a safe port in the raging waters of his mind. So, I mean, that sure was something else. He heard the awkward attempts at conversation from Kyuka, her two jacks withdrawing their contact from his skin, the vampire instantly missing their soft and soothing vibration. The girl took few steps away from him, just enough to jump back in case he did anything, yet close enough that he could easily sense her. I guess you are fine now, right, Midoriya? He opened his mouth to answer her, his voice coming deeper than the usual. I'm sorry about that, it was, not supposed to have happened. Even now, after having calmed down, Izuku could still feel the whispers of the geek beast within, the low and rasping touch that egged him to attack the rocker one more time. He chained the thoughts with cold steel, the voice in his mind dying down. For now. Yeah, I guess so. Kyuk Kyuka let one of her arms hum limp while the other held it, the awkward mood still reigning among them. The scent of freshly drawn blood called for the vampire's attention, his eyes turning to glance down at May who was still oddly quiet in his embrace. That made some color show in his face, the barest hints of a blush betraying his feelings as his mind finally caught up to their current position. He gave the mechanic girl's neck one last lick, his saliva full of blood clothing agents to aid in stopping the bleeding of the two tiny perforations that adorned her tender flesh. 
It surely made him look like some sort of pervert, but he would deal with that later. Very much later. Preferably when he could come with some believable excuse. He slowly separated himself from Hatsum, almost whining when his body could not feel her body heat close to itself. When had he become this pathetic? The Hemomancer questioned himself as he rose to his full height. He turned and tried to meet his classmate's eyes, wondering if she would listen to anything he say, she had not fled the area running away in horror, so he chalked one up to his chances, as minimalistic as they were. I owe you an explanation for what happened. He said in what he hoped to be a good tone, his voice still deeper than usual. The girl rose one hand to stop him, her face still settled with an awkward expression as she had no idea what to expect in such a situation. Now, you don't owe me anything. Things happen, it is okay. Kyuka tried to be casual about it, even, even if she sounded rather stiff. Izuka shook his head, drawing a deep breath and exhaling it in an exhausted manner. No, things like this don't just happen. Please, at least let me apologize. He sucked in the social department of things, but he knew some things had to be done. He bowed his head and torso together hoping that even if she did not forgive him, she at least listened to his apology. Please, forgive my blunder in my control over my instincts and attacking you, Kyuka-san. If there is anything that I can do to make up for this, please say so. The punk girl tried to say something to make the vampire stop, but she guessed he would still keep at it. She began fumbling with one of her jacks, wondering what she was supposed to do in such a situation. Yeah yeah, I guess. Geez, why do you have to be so stiff, or are you cosplaying as Ida? She complained, getting close to him and touching his shoulder. Come on, stop that already. If someone saw this, they might get the wrong impression about us. There was a blush staining the rocker's face, her right hand constantly spinning her ear jack as she tried to pick her way through her words. Let's just settle with you owning me a favor, okay? She quickly reached a compromise, making Izuku finally stop with his bow. The vampire rose his face and met her amethyst purple orbs, the duo staring at each other in a silent contemplation. Then, the vampire almost buckled on the ground as the girl from earlier jumped on his back. I-Z-U-K-U. Tell me in details how this happened. Come on, details. I need the info, I might have another baby ready for you. The seriousness of the situation plummeted as both Izuku and Kyuka did a double take as to what they had heard. The vampire knew what May meant, he had been together with her for quite a while, his classmate, however, was left in the dark about, about the issue. May. What did I told you about phrasing? BB baby? The grease monkey hanging on the vampire's back tilted her head to the side, her cross sight pupils adjusting to take the sight of the other girl in, wondering if she said anything weird. Right, Izuku mentioned that talking about babies made people feel awkward because they misunderstand easily. The blooming smile in Hatsum's face grew even more, if such thing was possible, and she nodded rapidly. Yeah I got it. I have an idea for a support item for you. There, it's fine like that, right? Hatsum was so static she almost vibrated on her perch on the vampire's back. And for her too. Do you know how her quirk works? Hey, you. How does your quirk work? What can it do? And just like that, May slid off his back to invade the personal space of the rocker. The mood shift was quite drastic, but it was a relief for the vampire as May began hounding over Kyuka, throwing question after question at the girl, not waiting for answers as she shot another barrage of questions over. Kyuka turned to look at him, eyes pleading for help of some sort from the vampire. He nodded, coming closer to the two girls. His hand scooped May, throwing the girl over his right shoulder as one would when carrying a bag. Enough, May. Let Kyuka sand breath before you question her like that. He said, easily carrying the mechanic. She squirmed in his grasp, doing her best to reach the ground to once more hound the punk rocker with a million questions.
Kyuka exhaled a tired sigh, thanking the Himamancer with a head nod. He responded with the same gesture, right hand firmly holding Hatsum by her waist. Now that the mood was somewhat lighter, Izuku figured he could explain explain what happened and introduce Mei to his classmate. Who knew, maybe they would hit off and become friends. Kyuka-san, this is Hatsum Mei, a friend of mine from the support course. She is quite enthusiastic about building and creating support items, so please bear with her if she starts to get overly excited. He introduced them, the mechanic girl looking back at Jairu with her almost maniac grin. Mei, this is Kyuka Jairu-san, a classmate of mine from 1A. His introduction for Kyuka was simple and short, considering he did not know much about her besides that her ears were sensitive and that she enjoyed old-school music. Air, nice to meet you? The rocker was still a bit out of it with these two, considering the events that happened so far. And it was only lunch. After introducing his friend to his classmate, the trio spend the rest of lunch break over on the roof, slowly talking. It still was a somewhat awkward affair, but it was much more tolerable. As the school bell sang the end of their break, the students went to their respective classes. As Izuku and Kyuka slowly returned to their classroom, the duo proceeded in silence. They almost entered together, when the rocker realized something. The entirety of their classmates had seen Izuku exiting through the window, and most probably they noticed that she had rushed to check on his state. It was an act out of worry, her enhanced hearing allowing her to pick up on the finer details of his state. That, however, was not the case for most of their classmates, and considering this was a high school, even if one for hero trainees, she could already hear the whispering of some of her classmates should they enter together. Ashido Mina was probably the easiest one for Kyuka to guess that she would be the type to enjoy girl gossip, and that meant ridiculous teasing as the pink girl would bother her constantly with the boyfriend type of teasing. Hence, to avoid such trouble, Kyuka stopped in front of the door, since she was the one leading their way back. She turned around to meet her classmate, wondering if he would get the message. Her eyes glanced at his orbs, trying to convey the message wordlessly. He looked at it with curiosity written all over his face, wondering why she had stopped. Of course, the vampire would not get social cues. She joked within her mind, glancing at the door and back at him. It took a few seconds, but eventually he seemed to have figured out her message. Kyuka felt a bit bad, as it looked almost as if she did not want to be associated with him, but this was for the benefit of both. Never underestimate the power of gossip among high schoolers, middle school had taught her such lesson, and maybe to him too. Izuku nodded to her, taking a few steps back. She opened the door and entered, closing it and wandering to her seat. Yeodia's Rozu already on her seat, her face full of worry for her as Kyuka approached. Where have you been, Jairusan? I was beginning to get worried for you. Momo said, almost like a mother hen fussily worrying about her chicks. Kyuka waved her hand without worry, sitting on her chair with a passive face. What has gotten you like that, Yamamo? The rocker asked, hearing the door open and Izuku walk in. His friends greeted him, a few of the others in class sending curious glances at the vampire. No wonder, he fled by climbing out of the damn window, she justified their curiosity. What? You felt that, right? Momo squeaked, trying her best to whisper and glance discreetly, discreetly at the vampire. You saw what M.M. Midoriya-san did back on the beach to Tokoyami-san. Yes, she had seen it. It was surprising for sure, but the two had already explained the situation to her. Kyuka did try to explain it to Momo, but the taller girl had effectively avoided the conversation altogether. It frustrated the rocker a bit, but she could not force the rich girl to become friends with the resident vampire of the class. Jairu was about to bring the same point across again, that the two had agreed to the act of blood drinking, but Samenta sensei entered the classroom, the majority of the class quieting down for the lesson to begin. What she did not notice, however, was the wide-eyed expression that Yayorozo sent her way, as the rich girl noticed a tiny tint of crimson red lightly staining the rocker's neck, two round holes being the source of the insignificant bleeding. The last week of before the school festival was somewhat hectic in the school as everyone's tension rose, those that left things for the last hours rushed their preparations as best as they could. The major focus of the festival were the physical activities, 
but that did not mean that the other courses were neglected. UA was the best hero school in Japan, any of their courses were great chances. The vampire was aware of this fact now more than ever, having to be the one responsible for Mei's sleeping schedule. He had already given Tokoyami his last instructions, giving the raven-headed teen some privacy for him to work on anything that he wanted to keep hidden until the festival. Their training, while productive, also exposed them quite a bit since Izuku hadn't had the opportunity to modify his property on Dagoba Beach. He kept it clean and mostly free, free of trash, but every once in a while, you could spot the occasional washed-up litter. He couldn't exactly try his hand at amateur building, he was no constructor after all. Trying to be cheap about something that he would constantly be using would be extremely detrimental, even dangerous should he invite someone over. The vampire had been looking for a few construction companies, but the majority of the ones he found were overly expensive. There would be plenty of time for him to work on that, so the Hemomancer left the issue aside, focusing on more important matters. That meant that Izuku was home. More specifically, he was in his room, examining his right hand as if it held the key to the mysteries of the universe. The limb was perfectly fine, if one were to ignore the shifting black marks that were slowly spreading all over it, nonsensical patterns being drawn up on the length of his arm and hand. He was lucky that Mei was currently in the kitchen, eating as per his orders. The girl was a handful, having had spent the last 12 hours running with nothing in her stomach except coffee as she worked on last-minute adjustments for her approved support gear. He had had to exercise a moderate use of, mesmerize, upon her, the specific orders assured him that she would spend at least one hour before she was allowed to leave the dinner table. Leave the premises of this habitation and direct thyself to the kitchen. Leave there not until they have eaten enough to compensate for thy horrendous habit of overwork, young lady. A bit of a hand-strong method, but unless one is willing to do so, May would try her hardest to continue obsessing over work until she passed out of either exhaustion or from lack of nutrients. She was that dedicated about her work. It wasn't as if he could exactly admonish her, her too much, since Izuku himself was guilty of this type of behavior, so he would let her leash go slack for a bit. Returning to the matter at hand, he chuckled to himself at the pun, Izuku continue observing the shadows that were moving over his limb. They felt weirdly material, their consistency over his skin assuring him that they were solid and not merely a trick of sight. He did a little experiment, allowing blood to exit his skin at the same spots that the shadows were mingling about, the two intertwining to become a strange mix of crimson and black, almost resembling murky ink. Exerting more of his power, the vampire made the unusual mix to shape itself as a tentacle, having no trouble in controlling his creation. The black shadows were tangible enough to be manipulated as such. The gift from the shadow beast master. His power is also ours now. The shadows are ours to command. Such power is only expected from us. Worthy. We are worthy of this. The whispers in his mind became much clearer too. Hunter instincts were mostly a sense, something just like his sight or his hearing. At most they would be considered a feeling, the darkest aspects of, true ancestor, the rare time that they were clear and direct to him were in moments that Izuku was either in great emotional stress or riding a high of hormones. To have his own quirk explain itself this clear, it was a bit weird and frightening. That the inner beast was now had this much sentience, it made the vampire worry. Izuku recalled his blood, leaving only the shadowy tendril running about the length of his arm. He stared deeply at the tendril, emerald eyes tinted in crimson gazing into the black energy slash matter that was constantly shifting, yet stayed st still. And then, for a fraction of a second, the vampire felt as if something had stared back at him. The teen with green hair dispersed the shadow over his arm, the sensation of the black matter running all over his body was weird. It quickly ran up his arm, sliding down his torso and legs until it pulled over his shadow. The black matter quickly pooled and merged with his shadow until it looked no different from usual. What have I developed this time? Izuku asked himself, leaning back on his chair and staring at the ceiling for answers. None came to vampire this time, the mere hum of the power that run under his skin the only thing he could feel. As he sat there, contemplating what he would do with his newly developed power, the teen felt the door of his room be opened, had some slowly entering it in a futile attempt to sneak in and do some work behind his back. He rose one eyebrow, 
pretending to not have noticed her hand reaching over his desk as she crawled on all fours in hopes of him not catching her up. Her hand slowly stretched over towards the desk, getting closer and closer to grab the boot she had been working on before he interrupted her. Her fingers brushed against the metallic surface of the footwear before they stopped completely, a crimson tentacle wrapped around her wrist. May's head slowly turned to check the captured limb before she came with a last attempt to grab her work. It's all or nothing. The mechanic girl shouted, rapidly getting up and jumping to her goal. Unlucky for her, all that she managed to do was wiggle uselessly suspended in the air as another three thick tendrils of blood snatched her up. She turned her head around to look at Izuku, a sauce stain on the corner of her mouth indicated that she at least had eaten before rushing back to try and work on something else. May. He said with no discernible emotion behind his voice, nearly staring at the girl. Zuku. She responded, her usual grin still fixed over. The vampire sighed, rubbing the bridge of his nose with his left hand, right one busy holding her up with his power. What were you trying to do? He asked, slowly lowering her to the floor. Work. May answered with the cleanest, most straight face possible. Even now that he had his full attention on her, she looked like she wanted to dash and grab the boots. What did we agree upon? He asked, coming closer to her until he reached the distance of an arm's length. May looked ready to whine, throwing her arms up in exasperation before crossing them under her chest. That I was not supposed to overwork. But I'm so close to perfecting the booster mechanism of my boots. They will allow me to jump for 10 meters longer. Besides, the kinetic absorber gel needs some testing, since I was hoping to put some on your next costume upgrade. I figured what better way to test it than when during the school festival. Besides, all those support companies will be dying to get a taste of my babies. Allowing May to flesh out her ideas would only lead you into accepting whatever ridiculous request she would manage to get out of you, something she was rather good simply by the fact that she would pester you until you promised to do so. Hence, when Izuka noticed that the girl began slowly scotching over the desk, he also kept closing the distance. Even if she grabbed her boots, he would not allow her to run away. Even now, she was planning on tricking him to work on a finished product. Thus, the duo eventually ended up reaching the desk. May had her backside glued to the wooden desk, Izuku having it completely closing the distance between them as she kept spitting out ideas and projects at a pace even a Chris Vector .45 ACP would be jealous of. Off. He only nodded and listened to her, his hands ready to catch her the moment she tried her stunt. It wasn't much later until she tried to do so, failing immediately as the moment her hands once again touched the boots, the items were knocked off by his blood tendrils, the vampire's hands grasping at the girl's sides. Izuku then noticed that they were much too close, her breasts lightly brushing against his chest. The sight was enticing, now that he wasn't worried about May fleeing to do some work. She was clean from any dirt, grease, or motor oil that was so usual, and aside from the sauce stain at the corner of her mouth, she smelled as clean as the day they had their first time. Well, give or take a few hours of sweat as she had been tinkering with her equipment, but the scent was so naturally inviting, full of her pheromones, that it was a wonder he had not noticed sooner. May then closed the last of the distance between them, leaning against his chest even with her two hands seized by his blood tendrils. The sight began flaring heat within the vampire. It seemed that he wasn't the only one feeling like this, since May's face was now sporting a flushed blush that tickled his every nerve, sending lightning coursing through them. To be honest, I wasn't thinking of work at all. Since when you drank from me on the school's rooftop, I have been feeling like this. Her breath was baited, coming out in pants as she squirmed her body against his, taunting Izuku with her womanly assets. He recalled that at that moment, his mouth had been filled with aphrodisiac-laced saliva, as his target had been Kyuka, Kyuka, before he cleared his mind. Now, the pink haze of lust was calling, and its name was Hatsum May. I tried to focus on work, but then you would pop in my head and I couldn't focus anymore. Can we? May did not finish her question, but then again she did not need to. Izuku had been putting the issue of their first time having sex aside for a while, considering May herself never had brought it up or made a fuss about it. It was an intimate act for sure, yet they had not had had firm boundaries on their relationship for a while. 
Hence why Izuku hadn't had tried to have intercourse with Mei again, his mind wondering what they were supposed to be. Must you complicate this for any longer? Our mate wishes for intimacy. Embrace her. The inner beast complained from the depths of his mind, flaring further his lust for Mei. The sight of her practically begging for him, hands tied and at his will brought about a rather sadistic joy to the Hemomancer. He let the complicated thoughts that filled his head be filed away for now, nodding to her request as he took her lips, the kiss making the girl release a heated and satisfied moan. His tendrils slacked their hold on May's wrists, allowing her to undo the buttons of her jumpsuit, letting the clothing fall on the floor. As it happened, she began running her hands under his shirt, massaging the muscles of his torso. One of the vampire's hands went for his desk, opening one of the drawers and rummaging through it for a few moments before he found the item he was looking for. Last time he had been foolishly heated and rushed, risking them both in his lust-filled haze. This time, however, Izuku had been prepared. It was only ever so embarrassing when the clerk from the convenience store kept glancing questioningly between him and the box of condoms. Forget that ridiculous contraption. Let us feel her raw flesh. Get rid of that useless rubber. It took colossal amounts of effort for him to not listen to the idea, opening the box and pulling out one of the many packets. No, no Aki this time, sorry for that lads. When the next morning came, Izuka woke up feeling amazingly refreshed. He exited his bed slowly, the light of the morning lazily filling his room as if sensing the mood of the Hemomancer. There was a whining sound that echoed inside his room, the husky scent putting ideas in his mind, he shook his head, hoping to clear the lewd thoughts away. He made his way to his window, opening it to air his room and hopefully dissuade himself from any other funny ideas. The vampire glanced at the carelessly thrown aside box that littered the floor of his room, finding it empty of any of its previous contents. Leaving that for later, he returned to his bed, the sight of the naked girl almost sparking his lust again. We have the festival to attend to. Later, calm yourself Azuku. Shook his head, touching the girl sleeping on his bed. May, wake up. He called her out, the girl complaining and turning her back to him. Izuka raised one of his brows questioningly, wondering if she was being lazy or if she was truly tired from their nightly activities. He glanced at his alarm clock, seeing that they still had plenty of time before they had to head off for school, the vampire let the girl have her rest. He took his towel and sneakily headed to the bathroom, hoping his mother would still be asleep. Asleep. She had promised to be watch his performance, even when she would still be at work. The vampire made sure to set the shower to cold enjoying the sensation of the cold water running over his body. It doubled as a bonus that it mostly settled the morning heat from earlier. Izuka took his time with his shower, exiting it with his towel wrapped around his waist, the teen made his way to the kitchen to start working on his breakfast. The Hemomancer opted for something simple, opening his fridge to grab a few eggs to work with. He set the eggs on the counter as he searched around for the remaining items. Bread buttered and, in the toaster, eggs currently frying and coffee brewed, Izuku craned his neck to the side, releasing a popping sound and working his pan as May's arms wrapped around his frame, pressing herself against him. Damn, that smells good, Zuku. The mechanic rested her chin on his right shoulder, standing at the tip of her toes to get a view of his cuisine. It wasn't fancy, but he took pride at least on being able to cook a good breakfast. Thanks. He said, slowly turning and bringing the frying pan with him. May continued to cling to his frame, lazily following his steps as he approached the kitchen table, the dishes already set out for the three. He poured each plate a portion, going next for the toaster that had just finished doing its job. The meal fully prepared, Izuka tried to head to his room. You know I can't exactly move around with you glued to my back. The girl ignored him, nuzzling her cheek against his back. You can always do that tentacle thingy that you did last night. Her com comment made the Hemomancer blush a bit, the memory of that particular act coming to surface. At least eat something before we head out. I just need a quick change. He groaned a bit, trying to appeal to the mechanic girl's stomach. It seemed to work fine as May slid off his back and sat down to eat. Izuku turned to see that she was properly eating, taking in her image. 
She was only dressed in one of his t-shirts, the clothing a few sizes bigger than her made the sight interesting for sure. His fangs itched a bit, but he controlled himself and made his way back to his room. A few minutes later, the vampire was back to the kitchen, dressed in his UA uniform. May had finished her food, and now was lazing about on the couch of the living room, messing with her phone. Izuka shook his head at her, going to the mini fridge and picking a few blood bags to drink along his food. He quickly ate his meal, also taking his phone and scrolling through a few media posts. It seemed that everyone was excited for the event, considering that his social feed was all about it. The vampire would continue doing so until it was close to his departure time, but his eyes glanced at May back on the couch. She was still in the same position as before, sprawled all over it. Only a small detail had caught his attention. His t-shirt rode up to her hips, revealing that she was wearing nothing under it. He huffed, reining in his lust. May, how about you get ready for us to go? He suggested, a hint of annoyance dipped in his voice. She whined, but still followed with it, slowly dragging herself to his room. Don't forget to take a shower too. Yes, daddy. I'll pretend I did not hear that. Izuko said, hands over his mouth, his mug forgotten over over the table. May had the decency to look ashamed. I'll pretend I never said that. I won't. The voice made the two whip their heads to look at the source, Midoriya Inko. Dressed in her work attire for the accounting company she worked for, the woman had a mischievous grin fixed on her face. And a phone that just flashed, signaling that she had taken a picture of their current frozen faces. Making their way to UA was, at least, less embarrassing for the vampire and the mechanic. A few people greeted them on their train ride, wishing them good work and the such as they caught sight of the UA uniforms. At least that was the case for Izuku, as Mei went with her usual jumpsuit attire. He tried convincing her to use the girl's uniform, but the following teasing by his mom made the task unbearable. Izuku was sure that when he reached home, the picture Mama Midoriya took from their faces would be printed and framed to be proudly displayed to any and every visiting guest that stepped foot inside the Midoriya household. A few preschooler kids had even come closer to him and had wished the vampire good luck on the event, before they returned to their caretaker. The lady waved too, even if a bit intimidated by his face. As they reached the campus, the duo hugged. I hope that you do well out there, Zuku. When you become a high-tier hero, many businesses will have their eyes on you, and any support item that you might be wearing, and then they will come to me. May exclaimed, taking her phone out as she side-hugged him, taking a picture. She quickly messed a bit with her phone, forwarding the picture to him. The vampire managed to catch a few whispers and comments about them, but he ignored them in favor of getting his phone. Backslash one unread message from May May backslash. He was about to open it but Hatsum took his phone from his grasp. He allowed it, con considering that he would get the bigger surprise later when he displayed his new ability. Not yet. You can only open it when you are alone. That said, May quickly looked to the sides. Noticing that no one was currently looking at them, the girl gave the vampire a quick peck on his lips. If you win first place, I'll give you even more. She whispered on his right ear before quickly skipping her way to support studies. Izuku stayed still for a few moments, processing whatever had just happened. Then, he clenched his right hand, eyes beginning to gleam with eldritch power. I'll win. His feet were fast to make way to the heroics building, faster to reach his class. His classmates were in various states of excitement, a few greeting him. The intercom sounded and gave instructions for the students, and they followed with it. Inside the locker room, Izuku quickly shed his blazer and shirt in favor of Yue's blue gym outfit. He managed to get his pants before someone called out to him. Midoriya. The pockets of conversation that were happening inside the room died down as all eyes were gathered to the vampire in question. The green-haired teen wondered whatever Todoroki Shoto would want with him considering that the duo-haired teen had gone quite long only speaking the absolute necessary with his classmates. It was odd, so the Himamancer turned to meet his usually silent classmate. The scarred teen had a serious expression fixed in place, analytical eyes looking straight at the vampire. 
I think that from a technical standpoint, I am stronger than you. The declaration was not something Izuku was waiting to hear from the Todoroki. Maybe from someone like Bakugu, however, the words clearly left Shoto's mouth. My quirk is better suited for a multitude of tasks, and I have been training harshly since my younger years. Yet, something is different about, about you. Since the incident at the USJ, I have been trying to figure this out, but have yet to succeed. The mood of the boys inside the locker room because filled with tension, some of the more excited teens displaying their fervor. Bakuga's grinding teeth could clearly be heard by everyone, yet the ash blonde stayed his hand, realizing that Shoto still had something to say. My quirk is no secret, but as you have seen I only use one side of it. I plan on doing just that to win this competition, since the other side of this power is cursed. I wanted to say that I'll be sure to win this and figure out what makes you special. Todoroki finished his piece by staring at his left hand, eyes then going out to meet the vampires. It was not a smart decision. Izuku's eyes, usually a calm emerald green, were crimson slits that shone with malicious light. The vampire had his lips fixed into a savage sneer that promised the most overwhelming pain, the whole visage of the Hemomancer not unlike something out of a horror movie. The teen fixed his shirt in place, hiding the visage of his lean abdominal muscles and slowly walked closer to the boy with duo-colored hair. Each step seemed to resonate with the ambient noise, the silence in the locker room just short of deafening. The vampire finally stopped his steps, face to face with Shoto. Is that so? Your power is cursed? The words left Izuka's mouth almost as if the teen was spitting them out, disgusted by what he had just heard. To everyone's surprise, Izuku jabbed Todoroki into his chest with his right hand pointer. Is that how you plan to save people when the time comes? Half-assing things enough just to get by, as if some second-rate paper pusher? Tell me, Todoroki, what happens when the day comes and your ice is useless? The vampire's vampire sneer allowed the boys of his class to have a full look at his pearly white fangs, some cringing away from the sight. I'll show you, foolish little Todoroki, a true cursed power. The vampire declared, maintaining his crimson pupils as he left the locker room, his steps echoing in the minds of all present. What the hell? That was so scary and so manly. Karashima excitedly exclaimed, making a show of displaying his biceps. I can't let you guys get so ahead of me like this. I also challenge you, Todoroki. Bakugu, seeing that the entirety of this little fiasco had finished, scoffed loud enough to call attention to himself. Fucking bloodsucker thinks he is some hotshot. And you too, shitty icy hot. What, are you too good for the mortals of the world that we aren't worth your best? I fucking hope that have some soothing cream, because you were talking too much shit from that ass you call a mouth. You must be blind, cause you declared war on the wrong motherfucker. Watch me, since that will be the only thing you will be doing when I finish this shit first. The ash blonde turned and made his way out of the room, making sure to flip the bird to the remaining people inside the room, most specifically to the shocked Todoroki. Heck, since when did we enter a battlefield? Siro asked to Kaminari, fixing his gym uniform. The blonde shocker shrugged his shoulders. I know, right? Midoriya always has this aura of closet monster about him, but today he was at his creepiest. I felt as if he was staring at my soul. Denki explained, no true heat in his words. Tokoyami shook his head at the shenanigans happening inside the male locker room, dark shadow, popping his head from the ravenhead's torso to whisper at his master's ear. ear. As his quirk finished the task, it returned to its place, leaving Fumikage with a pensive expression. A hand touched the teen on his shoulder, the focused eyes turning to find Mashireo Ojiro. The tail, quirk user had a firm expression. Tokoyami-san, since you were the one to spend the most time with Midori USA, I was hoping you could share some knowledge with us? We don't exactly know much what to expect, and you have been training with him. The martial artist's words seemed to be true, as the remaining boys all turned their attention upon the raven-headed teen. Fumikage closed his eyes for a few seconds, wondering about this conundrum he had found himself in. He crossed his arms, the sight hopefully making him seem a bit sage-like, and hummed a low tune. I must apologize, as I lack the knowledge you seek. 
Midoriya san truly has no fixed style of combat or a strategy he sticks with. In our personal combat training, he seemed to develop plans of the fly, most of which were very successful against myself. Taking in consideration the amount of time that Midoriya san has had to plan, I wish all of you the very best of luck, for you shall need it against the freight train known as Midoriya Izuku. That sentence seems ominous, Ojiro thought to himself as he bowed and thanked Tokoyami for his advice. Ojiro knew that out of everyone in his class, he was one of the blandest and most forgettable. He was hoping to use the opportunity of this event to make himself better known to the hero agencies of Japan and hopefully get scouted by one of his favorite heroes. He had been over the moon when he managed to pass for UA's A1 class of heroics. His happiness was short-lived, as he soon discovered the type of competition he was faced with in his class. Overwhelming powerhouses such as Midoriya and Bakugu, resourceful people such as Jairu, Yayarozu and Siro, or strong established household names such as Todoroki and Ida. Standing out from su such a crowd would be tough, so the teen was willing to take any advantage he could manage. Considering now that the only helping hand he hoped to have had come short, Ojiro prayed that his skills could match up to that of his classmates. Call Midoriya a monster all you want, a one had plenty of monsters in itself. Izuku was at the front of his class, sandwiched between his now so-called rivals. Bakugo stayed surprisingly quiet at his place, fully focused into the tunnel ahead where the booming noise of the audience echoed. Todoroki had clammed up, maintaining a passive face as he stared ahead and effectively ignored the others around him. It was quite unofficial, but the three had sort of become the spearhead that directed the class. The class was beginning to grow impassive from the waiting, their tension becoming even greater as time trickled down. Luckily for them, present Mike was not a patient man. I hope that you all are ready to rue you a mumbly. The already highly loud voice of the hero was further amplified by the various speakers around the stadium, the hero trainees feeling their very bones vibrate in resonance with the rumbling voice. The following answer of the audience present in the stadium made many nervous, the raw energy of the spectators was able to be felt in the very core of the students. That is what I like to hear, my listeners. However, do not strain your voices yet, since you still need to shout for all these excellent students. The voice hero amped his audience to their maximum, the students swallowing dry as they sensed the incoming call. Surviving a villain attack this soon in their careers, and then coming out on top of such such situation, the golden children of UA, give it your all for class A1. Izuku took that as a cue for him to move. The vampire took a deep breath before beginning to walk, Bakugu bumping shoulders with the teen so as to not be behind the Himamancer. Todoroki followed both, a few steps behind the duo, the class following them. As they exited the tunnel, the true scope of their situation settled in for the teens. The vampire tuned out the external stimuli, else he would have a migraine, so great was the noise that boomed from the audience stands. Present Mike continued his presentation of the following classes, and the vampire found that many of the following classes were sending heated glares to the heroic students from A1. It was understandable, considering the following introductions were rather lackluster from a mediatic view. Not that the Hemomancer cared for the media show. The event, to him, was a challenge of his skills. The reward May promised was a bonus, a very welcomed bonus, but Izuku's focus was getting better to both be a great hero as well as to have greater control over, true ancestor. He understood the fact that being a hero was also a job, hence there would be those that were aiming for the big paycheck, not everyone had a bank account like him. To each their own, he mused in his mind, not bothered by the gazes of the other students. He had already survived from a life or death situation, some school kids getting pissy would not be a bother to him. Izuku was brought out of his musings due to the loud cracking of a whip, making him close one eye in amusement as his modern history teacher appeared on the concrete stage build on the middle of the stadium. The R-rated hero, Midnight did the seemingly impossible and further hyped the already excited crowd present. As the heroine proceeded to explain a few details and rules of the event, Izuku searched the sea of students for the one grease monkey that was so boastful of her inventions for the festival. However, before Izuku could find the mechanic girl, Midnight's announcement surprised him. And now, to represent the freshman students, we shall have the first placer of the entrance exam do the student's pledge. 
Give it your applause for a one's Midoriya Izuku. Midnight announced, clapping sounds thundering as still shots of his performance at the entrance exam were displayed among the extra-large screens spread all over the stadium, as well as being broadcasted by media. Izuku was taken back by this development, a very fake and very stiff smile settling over his lips. There was no way for him to run from this, considering all eyes were upon him. He was rather stiff as he walked to the podium, Midnight handing him the mic she had as silence settled upon the stadium, many eager to hear what the first place had to say. The gleam of his crimson eyes diminished as Izuku closed them, taking another deep breath. Plus Ultra. Izuku said calmly, the phrase one would expect only after his supposed grandiose speech. He laughed internally, slowly raising his head and opening his eyes, still portraying their animalistic characteristics. Such is the most inspirational phrase many of us have heard. It has many meanings, and yet also only has one. UA is the school that most applies this motto, a simple combination of words that can inspire hope into anyone that hears them. From one generation to the next, past, present and future, this hope had been carried and developed to such highs that even the heroes of the golden age could never have imagined. Izuku took a moment to quickly glance at all the students look looking at him, waiting for him to finish his speech. If only they knew that he was truly winging it. We are young and still immature. However, world, continue giving us our support and watch us. As we become the next generation of heroes, those that carry the meaning of these words on our backs and inspire the next generations to follow in those steps. That is UA, Izuku followed by pointing to the skies, before he left the podium and pointed his open hand to the ocean of students, presenting them to the stage of the world. This is Plus Ultra. The vampire finished his speech, giving the mic back to Midnight, who looked impressed with his improvised speech. An idea quickly sprouted at the top of his mind, and the vampire decided to indulge the whim. Right hand over his chest, left hand behind his back, Izuku did a perfect bow to the students, the thunderous applause of the spectators reaching a new high as the Himamancer righted himself. He left the stage as Midnight continued the last explanations, walking straight into the way of the youngest Todoroki. Can you do that, Shoto? The anger almost dripped from the words of the vampire, and somehow the half-hot, half-cold, quirk user knew that the greenhead was not talking about hyping the crowd. Can you inspire hope upon the world and the generations to come, when you are only giving half of your best? Plus Ultra, am I right? Todoroki managed to maintain his neutral face, but anger began simmering at the bottom of his stomach. As if you know what I have been through. You have no idea what that man did. I refuse to have anything to associate myself with his legacy. Don't, don't talk about what you don't know, Midoriya. As cold as his ice, Shoto shot a barb back at the blood drinker. Izuku Sai glanced at the other teen, the temptation of a quick use of, mesmerize, almost too good to pass up. The vampire managed to resist, moving to mingle among his classmates as they were headed into where the first event of the festival was going to begin. Many students were jam-packed at the corridor that was narrowing as it went about, the exit only able to allow the passage of three people maximum. That was, if they planned to ran on the ground. The vampire's eyes had another target completely. And that target had a raven head. Tokoyami. Midoriya. The two exchanged looks, the students around them wondering what was the deal with the scary-looking teens. I take that the has most wonderful plot already schemed for our current situation. The Raven had stated, as they waited for the signal from present Mike, Midnight had already explained the rules of the current event, a race with a multitude of obstacles for the trainees to surpass. I have some ideas running up here. Izuku tapped his right temple, a tiny black tendril wrapped around his finger. Tokoyami widened his eyes as he took in the sight of the power that was much too similar to his own. Why you can? The teen shut his beak as Izuku displayed a toothy smile fangs in full display. Wanna team up? Izuku offered his right hand for a handshake, the limb covered in dark matter as present Mike did a countdown on the background that was quickly reaching its end. Fumikage looked at the shadow-covered limb for all but one second before he grasped it with his hand, a firm handshake. Was there even a need to ask, Abyss Watcher? And glue. 
The mess that happened at the exit gate was impressive and surprising for many of the students, but the following frosty wind was an even greater surprise for those around the gate. Izuka smirked, his fangs itchy. Ending, the only thing they fear is you, Mick Gordon, Doom Eternal OST. But that will be the end of this video. Thanks for watching this video. Hoped you enjoyed this story. If you did enjoy this story, please leave a like and subscribe. And join the Discord down below. And make sure to check out Blood for the Blood God and the author Ryujin Mao on fanfiction.net. The link to the story is down below. So please go check them out and support them for making this great story. But that will be the end of this video. Goodbye. Kosho out.